Welcome to another episode of One Door at a Time, Concentric Educational Solutions Podcast, where we bring you guests to talk about topics that impact the lives of our students, our families, uh, and our communities. As we started off by uh, saying, we are, for May, we're doing a Wayne uh, County Superintendent's uh, uh, series. Uh, and we, we, have, we have an opportunity to, to hear from superintendents all across Wayne County uh, and speak about their journey, not just as a superintendent and their experiences as a superintendent, but their journey in life and kind of what brought them to where they are right now. Uh, this is going to be our, episode, our fourth episode. I have, to, I have to give a disclaimer. Yes, we are in the historic Detroit club. And yes, this is the same suit from episode three. However, I'm shooting it in the same day. I'm just on a different side. So that's the 52 fake out. So I just got to give that disclaimer. I don't want people thinking that David is wearing two suits back to back. I do have an array of suits. Shout out to my tailor. Uh, so I appreciate that. I have a wonderful, I have the distinct pleasure and wonderful opportunity to have a, uh, another amazing guest here, a great brother, um, Superintendent uh, Dearborn Heights number seven, affectionately known as D7, Dr. Tyrone Weeks. Uh, had an opportunity to meet this brother almost just less than a year ago. Correct. And um, man, it's the bonding, the brotherhood, um, uh, the intellect, the dialogue that we've had in such a short period of time. And uh, other than, you know, that black and gold should be crimson and cream, I think it's been uh, <laughs> a great relationship. But um, yeah, so welcome to, this, uh, welcome to our podcast. Uh, I appreciate it. And just, you know, I, I'd like, like you to start off by just telling, telling us about you. Where did you grow up? What started getting you into education? Well, first and foremost, thank you for having me here, good brother. It's Pleasure. always a pleasure to see you and to work with you. Uh, so my story started off right here in the city of Detroit. Mm -hmm. uh, my mom and dad uh, actually came to the city around 1967 during the Great Migration. Oh, wow. Uh, okay. Black, black folks from the South. So they came to the city. My dad uh, got a job working in Chrysler. So they were from the South? They're from the South. Okay. Small town, 60 miles north of Jackson, Mississippi, called Vaden, Mississippi. Oh wow. oh, wow. Yeah, small town. Uh, the current population is less than 1,000 people. So there are more kids in my district than my mom and dad's town. They were in the heart of the Deep South. The heart of the Deep South. <laughs> and they were there during a very difficult time. Yes. And so my mom and dad both lived through segregation. Uh, they lived through a lot of, uh, through obviously Jim Crow and a lot of struggles. And hmm. so when my mom and dad got to the point, my dad was 21, my mom was... 19, they both decided to leave. My mom actually moved to New York first, hmm. and then my dad moved to Detroit, got a job in a factory, and then sent for my mom. And oh, then they good. lived in Detroit, right here on the north end of Detroit, uh, for my entire life. My mom and dad lived in a few spots on the north end, but uh, I lived in the same house my entire childhood from the time I was conceived hmm. until I left to go to college. Well, wow. And so I left went to Eastern Michigan University, but before that, proud graduate of Detroit Public Schools. Um, what high school? Detroit Northern. Detroit uh, Northern, okay, yeah, yeah. My wife is a Cass Tech alumni, she never lets me forget that. Okay. Uh, but I tell her there's more than one high school in the city. Yes. So uh, I went to Detroit Northern. Uh, famous graduates like Smokey Robinson, Derek Coleman, and the late, great Betty Shabazz also that's right. yeah, came out that's of Detroit right. Northern that's High right. School. And so uh, I went there, had great teachers, great experiences, even before that middle school, great, great teachers, great counselors. And as a kid growing up, you know how educators always tell you, you can be anything that you put your mind to if you believe it. I actually believed it. Hmm. And so in spite of a lot of circumstances in the neighborhoods that were not the kindest growing up as a kid in the, uh, in the 80s, you know, there were a lot of challenges growing up in the neighborhood. Uh, in spite of all those things, I learned resiliency, I learned community, I learned hard work, friendship. Uh, I still have friends to this day who have been my friends for over 40 years. Wow. Um, so went off to school and became an educator. Uh, ironically, my goal was to come back to Detroit and become a teacher that never came to fruition. I got a job working in Ann Arbor Public Schools, mm -hmm. did that work for a long time and then became a principal and then eventually became a central office administrator, and then for the past couple of years been a superintendent. 
Wow. So take me back to growing up in, because I, I think uh, with everybody I speak to, uh, Detroit is so unique in its grit, in its resiliency, mm -hmm. uh, what people have, have experienced. So coming, coming up in Detroit, what was Detroit like in the late 80s, early 90s as you were coming through? So it's, it's interesting because, you know, I lived in a neighborhood that there were a lot of um, alternative ways of making money. Okay. All right. And, um, but the, the, the guys and the people growing up did the best they had with what they had. Mm -hmm. And so um, at the time, you don't realize the devastation that is going on as a result of that. It is, you're trying to make, you're trying to make a way out of a very meager existence, you know? And when uh, you're living in a situation where, you know, your parents are struggling to make ends meet and somebody gives you an opportunity to make a couple bucks, mm -hmm. regardless of how you make it, guys are making those choices. So I was fortunate because my, my mom and dad were both together. My dad was in my household and he was a deterrent, you know, <laughs> and, and straight up with you. My, my father uh, had an instrumental impact in my life hmm. and my dad was my mom and dad were the only only married family on my entire block oh wow and my do you have do you have siblings yes i have two older bro i have sorry i have a younger brother hmm. an older brother and two older sisters oh wow okay and so my dad and mom became like surrogate parents to a lot of people um their house was always open my mom was a, phen a phenomenal cook um, brought that southern flavor mm -hmm. to Detroit, so uh, our house was always open. Uh, my brother um, is eight years older than me, so he lived in a time period where it was the heart of the crack epidemic. He was in the he was in the mid eight like yes. er, yeah okay yeah so he he came out of high school in eighty six. Oh, that's yeah that's that's so yeah. it was it was it was on and popping at that time. Period. That's Young Boys Incorporated. That's Young Boys Incorporated Zoo Crew. Uh, Earl Flynn, there was a whole lot of crews in the city. Okay. And he actually joined the military to get away from the city. Oh, wow. That was his way out. So he joined the military. Um, you know, I'm eight years younger, and it was tough, but not as tough. Okay. Right? Um, when I was coming up, we were kind of the offspring of the devastation. Where my, hmm. my older brother, they were part of the, the culture that was living through a lot of the problems. Okay. And so when I was coming up, my friends dibbled and dabbled in a lot of things, um, but school was my outlet. Mm -hmm. And so I hung with everybody else and kind of did as much as I could without getting in trouble. Okay. And then um, school was my safe haven. And I, I always found refuge in school. Okay. Yeah. So now you're out of high school, you're at Eastern, uh, Eastern Michigan. Yep. Your goal was to be a teacher. What led you to like talk about your your path to administration. So initially, when I went back to grad school, I went to I went to be a counselor. Okay. So I wanted to be a school counselor. My mentor at the time was a school counselor, and uh, he actually put the application in my hand for a scholarship. Hmm. Okay. And he said, you know, it's a great scholarship opportunity. You should consider going back to school. So I applied for a scholarship. This is why you were an undergrad? This is what this is. I'm sorry, this is when I was teaching. Oh, okay, okay. So I was already teaching at this point. So I was out of school. Um, I was in the work of, I was working in Ann Arbor Public Schools at the high school, Pioneer High School. And uh, my friend and mentor, Dr. Victor Kennerly, also a graduate, uh, also a resident of Detroit, uh, lived and worked in as well, but he's like 20 years my senior. Okay. So he pulled me to the side and said, fill out this application. So a mentor and a colleague. A mentor and a colleague. Okay. So he put an application in my hand. I was going to school and I was paying out of pocket. I applied for a scholarship and earned a scholarship to get my master's and my doctorate. Okay. So I got that from Eastern Michigan. Um, I went back to school. I was working along the course of being a school counselor. And then um, at the time, our building principal was also a military man. He was a drill sergeant. Like literally, he was a drill sergeant. And this was the time of the second Iraq war. He was deployed to go back into the war to train soldiers. Oh, wow. Okay. So the 12th grade principal became the building principal. I was working as a teacher and as like a program coordinator. Mm -hmm. 
they asked me if I would consider being uh, the interim assistant principal. And I did. And I, I fell in love with the work. Okay. And then I went, changed my major from counseling to ed leadership. Mm -hmm. And then from that, got my uh, master's in K-12 administration. And then eventually became a building principal. I did that work for about five years. I was AP for two, a building principal for five, and then went and became a central office guy. What was what, what are some of the things, uh, experiences, lessons, values that you developed uh, during the principalship? Oh man, the importance of relationships and uh, relationships with students, relationships with adults, relationship with parents, uh, having the commitment to see beyond the statistical data okay. because a lot of times the data that describes the experiences of kids in schools uh, could have you believing that kids have innate differences they don't all kids can thrive all kids can excel it's, it's about the culture it's about the expectations it's about your willingness to look beyond the factors that could impact how kids see themselves, about, about breaking down barriers and having the courage to do so. And a lot of times when you are in this work, there are real variables that impact student achievement, but it's not based upon the kids' ability to learn. So, and I took all that as a professional, as an administrator, because I had great principles as a kid. Mm. When I was in high school, I had a, I mean, this this guy, if you are from Detroit, you know the name Dr. Walter Jenkins. Dr. Walter Jenkins is in the Hall of Fame for Wayne State University for being a football player. He went in, oh, really? okay. he was in the Korean War. Um, <laughs> you know, he, he played for a ball for Detroit Lions. After he, stopped, oh, wow. after he stopped playing football, he went and became a teacher. <laughs> after becoming a teacher, became a principal. And he was that guy. He was a, he was what back then we weren't using the language turnaround principal. Uh -huh. That was Dr. Walter Jenkins. After Dr. Walter Jenkins, I had another great administrator, Dr. Marvin Yeomans. Uh, he's an Omega man. Okay. Uh, and I'm not, I don't hold that against him. Yeah. Uh, he's, still, he's a great man. He's a great man. He's also a minister in the city of Detroit. And um, I remember when I was a kid, like a lot of high school boys, I, I, I fell into. Um, you know, we go through those hormonal changes, right? Yeah. And so yeah. I just, you know, you start discovering young girls. And I remember one time I was cutting class and I cut class and Dr. Jean, Dr. Uh, Yeoman saw me from his window and came to my house mm. and knocked on my door and said, what are you doing? You're going to throw your life away. And then he talked to me about self-discipline and character and focus and all those things. And at the time, I wasn't trying to hear that, mm -hmm. you know. But I'm very, I'm, I'm eternally grateful for men like Dr. Yeomans and Dr. Jenkins because they actually saved my life, you know. Uh, you know, so many challenges going on in the neighborhood. Sometimes we engage in certain behaviors that are counterproductive because we're just trying to find our way. Yeah, absolutely. And like when you have someone that's in a position of being a mentor, it's important to have the heart and the sensibility to listen. And at the time when I'm 15 or 16, I wasn't listening, but yeah. I had mentors saying, listen, man, you can go somewhere, you can do something. And I had I had the same type of, I had to find my own way. Like when I first became a principal, you know, I was trying to be what I saw on TV. Okay. You know, everybody knows the story of um, uh, lean on me, Yeah. right? And uh, I'm like, I'm not Mr. Clark. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, Go ahead, jump. <laughs> so I'm not Mr. Clark. And then I had a great principal, like when I first started teaching, I had a principal, uh, another Omega man, this guy's name was Joe Doolin. Joe Doolin was the first principal, the first African-American principal in the history of the United States out of parochial school. Oh, wow. Detroit DuBois. Okay. And he was one of my early uh, influencers. He was my principal when I first started teaching. And um, it was a small school for at-risk kids. And every morning, he stood at the foyer of the school. He shook every kid's hand. Uh, we hand delivered report cards. Wow. Um, we didn't do the traditional teacher conferences. We had parent breakfasts on Saturday morning. 
we would come together and we would prepare pancakes and eggs and bacon and fresh fruit. And we would just talk about the children and talk about ways that we can support the kids. And we created this, he created this family. And then I took the same mantra with me uh, in small schools and in big schools. So if it was a hundred kids or 2000 kids, I, I really believe in the importance of creating a sense of community. Mm. And that community is within the school, it's with the faculty, it's with the parents, it's with the outside agencies, you know, like the universities, businesses, because we're all in this work together. You know, you know I, I think about reflecting from Delaware is I, I had three African-American males that stand out just as I was coming through school. Uh, Mr. Peel, um, who was a co-teacher, and there was about five of us in our fifth in the fifth uh, fifth grade class, five African American males, and I just remember, uh, I I had a, uh, a grandfather at home, but the other four did not. I know that for a fact, uh, and specifically my two friends, Eric and J uh, Jacob, and he like he just left an imprint in that when he um, his daughter I ended up going to high school with, she became a Delta. Uh, and I spoke, I uh, gave the eulogy at his, uh, at his funeral several years ago. But I just remember, like, the lessons that he, that he poured into us in, as fifth graders. Uh, the other principal, uh, African-American male, was Maurice Pritchett. He just, he just passed away. He's actually, uh, he was uh, actually a Kappa. Um, and, I mean, I'm just thinking about the lessons that he taught all of us. And that was in sixth grade. And then uh, Mr. Lane, who was my phys ed teacher in ninth grade, uh, in ninth grade, but when I went through the death of my parents in high school, mm -hmm. I remember a count like I didn't speak to a counselor or anybody. I went, I found myself down at that gym class, and I was cutting class. But Mr. Lane uh, knew I loved ping pong, and he literally played played ping pong with me. I mm -hmm. think for like two hours straight until I was ready to talk. Um, but I'm, I'm thinking about, like, you know, you're telling, you're telling this story and weaving this tapestry um, of amazing African-American male educators. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, and I think Detroit is, is rich, rich in that history. I remember going to a, um, when I first started coming to Detroit, I went to Pershing, the Doughboys. Mm -hmm. There is, I don't remember his name, but he, was, he must have been the principal of Pershing for like 15 or 20 years, mm -hmm. uh, African-American male. And because he was in the graduating class of each time. Mm -hmm. And you know, it speaks to what you were saying is that you, you have these lasting impressions uh, of, these, of these men that, that I, it still, seems like you still carry with, them, with you today about yeah. what you're doing. So now you're through your principalship. Talk about that leap. That leap from, okay, the chair, which is one thing being a principal, but now to the superintendency. So it's interesting, right? So I did not aspire to be a, a superintendent. That was not on my trajectory. That was not on my, my to-do list. Okay. Um, and when I went and um, went back to school to get my doctorate, I had some great um, influencers. Okay. And many of them were uh, African-American women. Um, Dr. Wanda Cook Robinson from Oakland Schools. Yeah, okay. Uh -huh. um, Dr. Sandy Harris was superintendent out there in Lincoln, Consolidated Schools. And when I got my doctorate, uh, they encouraged me to, um, both of them are Deltas, by the way. Okay. Um, both encouraged, and, and them as well as others, consider, really encouraged me to go back and consider the superintendency. And like the mindset that I've always had is like when you're a classroom teacher, you have an opportunity to impact the lives of the 150 kids who might be in your classes. Absolutely. Right? When you become an assistant principal or principal, you can impact <coughs> the entire building. Mm -hmm. When you are the superintendent, you have an opportunity to impact the culture of a community yes. that could have lasting, a lasting impression well after you're gone. And so, um, you know, when you go to schools, and all of us have our criticisms about school, right? Mm -hmm. as, as much good as schools do for children, there also, there's a lot of work that has to happen yeah. for schools to not have that predictability about who is successful and who's not successful. 
Um, and so as someone who really has focused on doing systems level work, the best opportunity to do that is as a superintendent. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it becomes complicated because you have the political side of the work that for any superintendent that tells you they expected that degree of politics, they're probably not telling you a whole, a whole truth. <laughs> the political side of being a superintendent is really, really um, steep. Mm. And you're navigating a lot of things. You're navigating, you know. Is that something that you that was unexpected that you didn't expect? So I expected it, but when you're in it, you're like, okay, yeah, this is is layers to it. It's one thing mm. to expect politics, and when you think about politics, you think, well, well, you know, you develop relationships with your union, you have, you know, your relationship with your board of education, but it is, you know, having the the coffees, the coffees out in the community, okay. talking with parents. It is planting seeds with businesses so that you can have some degree of reciprocity, relationship with them where it's give and take, mm -hmm. right? Um, it is, you know, planting the seeds with the community where you can pass a bond. Like you wanna, you wanna revamp old buildings or you want to build a new building like that costs money so yep. you got so you got to get something on something on the ballot and people have to see your vision and believe in your vision and vote on your vision because what you're asking them to do is use their hard on their hard on money mm -hmm. their taxes to support something that you're trying to advocate so the politic game of it is really really steep and um Sometimes it prevents you from being able to have the real classroom touches that you're accustomed to as a building principal. Okay. I try my best to be in schools at least three, four, five times a week, but sometimes I'm behind my desk. It, you know, it, it's interesting. When, um, when I did inspire to be a superintendent, I want to say maybe like 0203, um, finishing up my doctorate, I was in the practicum portion of it. And I did an internship, a summer internship with Dr. Joe Harrison, rest in peace. And I go into, I remember getting uh, very nervous that first day. Uh, he was superintendent of Baltimore County Schools. I go into his office and I'm thinking I'm going to get a crash course, so to speak, in being a superintendent. And so he's sitting behind his desk. He just tells me to sit in the corner <laughs> at a table. So I'm sitting in the corner for like 10 minutes and he was like, just read. Mm -hmm. um, and it was the Baltimore Sun. And I, I read it for like 40 minutes, cover to cover, every single thing. Finally, he gets up out of his chair and he said, if I would have gotten a speeding ticket, it would have been in the paper. Do you still want to be a superintendent? Interesting. And I was like, wow. Yeah. And this is before like social media had really jumped off and TikTok, Twitter, Instagram or anything like that, or camera phones for, for that matter. And it just gave me a perspective of the fishbowl that... All of you, uh, I was talking uh, last episode to uh, Steve McGee, and he was just saying, the very first thing that he came out, he said, the first thing I became when I became superintendent was a politician, and I didn't know that. I was a football coach and a principal. That's what I thought. Yeah. Uh, speaking to Derek, D.C., said kind of same, uh, same thing. Speaking to Styles, you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's that magnitude that I can't even imagine. Um, yeah. of what of what you what you experience so how do you keep the perspective of what needs to be done um, while dealing with all the bureaucracy and the challenge and the inherent challenges so you know a lot of people talk about the importance of balance right <clears throat> and balance sometimes can be hard to achieve because you want to say that you don't take work home with you mm -hmm. um, but you do it, it does impact you at home um, I'm fortunate that my wife is also an educator. Okay. Um, my wife is an educator. Uh, she is maybe 25, 26 years into public service through education. Uh, I met my wife in grad school. Uh, my wife is part of the reason why I became an alpha. She's an AKA. Okay. And um, she keeps me focused on keeping the important things in mind. We have kids, we have a 12-year-old, 10-year-old, and a 4-year-old, and sometimes when I am dealing with a, diff a difficult situation, hearing my kids' voices, hearing my youngest child's voice, 
um, it keeps things in perspective because ultimately, you know, I'm, a, I'm a dad and a husband first. Mm -hmm. um, I'm somebody superintendent, but my commitment first and foremost is to my family. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I hear those voices, and she has a way of giving me a look, and if she is, and I say this with the utmost respect, she's my harshest critic. Um, because she'll let me know when I'm completely left field, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. And she'll be like, listen, have you considered this? Have you thought about this? And uh, have you thought about this perspective? Which is, I can imagine, so important to have because you are literally probably making thousands of decisions, micro and macro, every day. Yeah. Um, even if you don't try to have those decisions in a vacuum, it's really hard because ultimately you're responsible for every decision or non-decision you make mm -hmm. to have an accountability partner just to give you a different perspective. Indeed, indeed. And so about those decisions, sometimes, you know, you are a part of the decisions that you're not even in a room to make <laughs> because you've empowered other people to make decisions. Yes. And so when you have empowered other people to make decisions, they are making decisions based in lockstep with their relationship and their understanding of the shared vision. Yes. And so when I don't believe in, I'm not a micromanager. I, mm -hmm. I've never believed in that. I believe in empowering people to be the best version of themselves and people are going to learn through trial and error. Mm -hmm. um, but to your point, you know, sometimes you're not even in a room and then people are making decisions and then they circle back around with you and let you know, well, you know, I did this. And you you can either say, you know, great. Or let's talk about that. Mm -hmm. um, or, you know, let's let's refocus on how we're going to do this moving forward. So mm -hmm. there's a multitude of ways of how you deal with it. But yeah, you know, you're making a lot of decisions. And these decisions impact adults, they impact parents, children, um, facilities, finances. It's a lot of stuff, you know? You know, what, what I've seen is that there's a, there's a commonality that, uh, that I've seen really good superintendents have of an, of an evenness that, the, uh, that all of you have displayed, and particularly doing this, this, this soup series that it's never too bad, it's never too good. There's an evenness yeah. uh, about it. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if that's innate or more so developed uh, because I'm the opposite of that as a, as a leader of a company. Like, there is no evenness uh, and my employees have to react to that sometimes and to their detriment uh, yeah. and their challenges. That uh, I, my favorite animal is a duck because I want to be like a duck. Mm. However, I, can see that. I struggle mm -hmm. uh, being being like a duck. Mm -hmm. Like your evenness, was it innate or something that you have to you had to learn? I wish I could say it was. I think you develop certain skills because you make a lot of mistakes. Hmm. <laughs> I remember my first uh, when I first, when I went through a principal academy. I had a mentor. Uh, she was actually at one point, she was the principal of Persian High School in Detroit. And she had became an administrator in the district I was working in. And uh, of a colleague, you know, we were coordinating this program amongst these three schools and a colleague of mine made a decision that I didn't agree with. And I sent her an email. And I was, as a kid say, I was in my feelings. So mm -hmm. I just, I sent her this email and I CC'd all the principals on it, <laughs> all the counselors on it. <laughs> I'm like 27, 20 years. Yeah. <laughs> and she hit me with a one-liner. She said, see me. And so I called her, made an appointment, and I went over to the building and I talked with her. And she talked to me about the importance of patience. She said, I get that you were frustrated, that this didn't go the way that you had planned. You put a lot of work into making this thing happen. It didn't go the way that you wanted it to. She said, it's okay, draft that email, but keep it in your draft box. Mm -hmm. She yes. said, if you feel the same way 24 hours from then, send it. But if you go back to that communication and you feel differently, change it up. Because she said, when you send that email out, you have to be okay with that being in the newspaper, okay. on the news. And so, again, to your point earlier, that was before social media. 
It's before Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. So when you send something out right now, it's not just local. It could be it could be global. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, I, I try to subscribe to that way of thinking of um, go slow to go fast. Mm hmm. And understanding that when you do something, it could have a domino effect. Yes. Now, I don't let that stifle me from making decisions mm -hmm. because sometimes you have to make a decision at that moment. Mm -hmm. And you have to be okay making difficult decisions too mm -hmm. that sometimes yes. are not popular. Yes. You know, I'm living through, I'm going through experience right now. Yeah. But, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, it's not a very popular decision, but it's one that. I would do it again if I had to because it's the right decision to make. Absolutely. Yeah. So if you if you could give so I, I want to end off these two questions. You became uh, correct me if I'm wrong in the time for you became superintendent during the hybrid of COVID, right? Like, correct. The, right. The transition. We were transitioning. We were on the la technically speaking, like the last year of the pandemic. But I became a super during the, during the pandemic. How how. How was that? So I can only imagine that being a superintendent at the start of the pandemic was much harsher. Right? Okay. Because at the start of the pandemic, you had people that were dying, right? Yes. Okay. Um, yes. There were all these unknowns mm -hmm. about the pandemic. And so as a result, you know, there were all these heightened protocols that we were doing to deal with this thing that we were still learning about. Mm -hmm. When I became a soup, we were on the tail end of the pandemic. So the most harshest days were kind of behind us and we were still utilizing certain protocols. But at that point, we were trying to wean ourselves off of those protocols. Mm -hmm. So we were coming back fully in person. Okay. We were demasking like it was the debate about to mask or not to mask. So we were mm -hmm. we were talking about that. That had to, I know that was very different than being a, super, a superintendent at the start of the pandemic. So mm -hmm. at the start of the pandemic, I was director of, of district safety for a school district. Okay. And so I know about all of those things that we were dealing with. I wasn't a superintendent, but all those critical decisions, like working with, you know, um, medical professionals, um, working with health department, working with, you know, all these agencies. I recall vividly the day we shut down <laughs> We were, I was talking to a colleague and we had our big rival basketball game that Friday. This, yep. is, this is a true story. So the two high schools that were the dominant high schools in this community had their rival game. And we were having this discussion about, do we shut down and impact this game that's on Friday? And I talked to our superintendent and I said, the NBA shut down last night. I remember, yeah, yes, yeah. No. I said, so we're talking about a high school basketball game. The NBA shut down last night. Mm -hmm. A billion dollar industry. I said, we should shut down. <laughs> mm. We should shut down, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, like later on, we realized that we were all making the right decision because at that point, nobody wanted to be the first district to, to shut down. Yeah. Yep. You know, you it was what, March 11th or the March 13th oh, or yes. something like that. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. Absolutely. Because I couldn't imagine even being at a building level. Hell, a classroom level, right? You don't know, and then immediately you shut down. There, there was no, you know, I was working with the school district that it, speaking to the chief of schools, we're not going to shut down. We're not going to shut down. That was on a Wednesday. Mm -hmm. Then I'm like, okay. Then Thursday, because they were talking about home visits, uh, we're just not sure. This is like less than 24 hours to then 48 hours, that's it. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, and, I was like, okay, what does that mean? Exactly. We don't know. Exactly. We, we don't know. Like we, I think, I think the experience that we had in education in the United States, and my assumption is across the globe as well, we did something that is exceptionally phenomenal. We shut down schools and recreated schools online. Mm -hmm. And we did so in a very short period of time. Yes. Like we were, sh I recall we were shut down like where no kids were for maybe like two weeks. And within two weeks, we were back remote. Yes. And providing kids with instruction, you know, synchronous instruction. And mm -hmm. it was complicated. Mm -hmm. We were delivering breakfasts and lunches. Yes, yes. We were, we were delivering 
packets and we were delivering Chromebooks and, you know, Wi-Fi instruments, all mm -hmm. those things. And so we, we did a tremendous thing in a very short period of time. Mm -hmm. The challenge is we had a really, we had 18 months where we could have really redesigned schools. Mm. But our commitment was to put schools back together the way they were before. And so we, we, we had an opportunity to do something that was different. But our commitment, like a lot of us, we, fu we function out of normalcy. Yes. And I remember this, this ideology around normalcy. Well, what's normal? Like is predictable failures for kids normal based upon skin color, and based upon hmm. socioeconomic status, and based upon area code? Is that, is that normal? Let's think about this thing. But the reality is we had to get kids back in school. Like I'm an educator, my wife is an educator. We had three kids that were home. Hmm. And as professionals, we were struggling to educate our own kids at home. Yes, yes, absolutely. You know, so I get it. I get yeah. it. You know, we we kind of we rely on the thing that we know the best. But um, you know, I think that hindsight being twenty twenty, we could have had a chance to do something that was really innovative. And and a lot of people are. A lot of people are doing some really innovative things. You talk about brother Steve McGee. You know, I went over to his school district when I first became a soup. And saw the innovation that they're doing over there in Harper Woods. You see the CCI Center? Oh, my goodness. Yeah, it, it's, it's breathtaking. It's, it's tremendous. Yeah. It's tremendous. Yeah, I said that everybody should have visited it. Just because it takes the traditional model of CTE and it creates a whole a physical space. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah. We, got some, we got some people doing some good work. Even, you know, my, my frat brother and superintendent, former, you know, colleague Derek Coleman is doing some great thing around trauma-informed schools. Yes. You know, recognizing that. With the dogs, he has you Absolutely. know he has a he has a classroom for uh, animals. Absolutely. For yes, for emotional support. Absolutely. So, we did a learn. We learned a lot during the pandemic, and you know, I'm looking forward to what the next leg of the journey looks like. You know, so it's not easy work. It has its complications, but it's rewarding work. Absolutely. Yeah. I want to thank you. Thank you not for just being a professional colleague, but a friend. Thank you for always picking up the phone, the guidance, the support. Uh, and taking the time and just in sharing your experiences. Always good, brother. All right. As always, uh, this is another episode of One Door at a Time, uh, Wayne County Superintendent Series. Uh, look forward to you joining us uh, for the next one. We're very interested. We're having a special summer series of One Door at a Time where it's going to be taped outside. So I'm going to give a shameless plug to uh, Beverly Hills 90210. Um, one of my childhood uh, shows uh, watching growing up, when they were had a struggling with uh, viewership after their first season, they, they did something counterintuitive. They, they taped during the summer, which usually they no other uh, sitcom would do, mm. uh, and their ratings blew up. So we're going to go live outside from my city, Baltimore City, Charm City. So pay attention to it. Uh, all the information is forthcoming. You can catch us as uh, always with all of our content at concentric.world. And until next time, Dr. Weeks, thank you so much. Uh, look forward to working with you in the future. Always good, Appreciate, appreciate you, right. man.